Welcome to Genet 500 Identity and Power Week 9. This week we'll focus on an introduction, social construction of gender, gender sexuality, gender performativity, gender socialization, gender stereotypes and roles, gender and power, intersectionality, stereotypes, stereotype threat, prejudice and discrimination, discrimination, social construction and race, and race and resistance. Welcome to Understanding Identity Unit 2. In this unit, we will study gender identities, race and ethnic identities, and the concept of intersectionality. Look at the image of the person on the screen, or think about the image of a person playing basketball. What does this photo tell you about them? What assumptions do we make when we see it? What comes to mind if I were to ask you what kind of job you think this person has? Are they rich or poor? Are they well educated? Where do you think they live? Are they a parent? A smoker? What country might this be? How old are they? And what do you think their gender is? Now look at this picture or think about the image of a man sitting at a big desk with papers in front of him. Who do you think this is? Are they rich or poor? Are they important? Well educated? Are they serious? Funny? Smart or boring? What country might this be? What kinds of assumptions do you make about the people in the image and why? Identities are very complex. Identities are made up of many parts. What are the most important parts of who you are? Were you the same person when you were 10 years old? What was different about you and what was the same? Think about yourself at age 16. What were your values? What kinds of hobbies did you have? Where did you think that life was going to take you? Think about yourself today. What matters most to you? What are your successes so far? What are your challenges? Identities change over time. You're a different person today than you were when you were 5, 10, or 15 years old. So what is it about us that stays the same? Are our identities consistent? The rest of this unit will explore different aspects of identities. By the end of this unit, you will be able to, one, consider how social norms shape the categories of gender and sexuality, Two, examine race as a social and historical process rather than a biological fact. And three, understand identity as a site of contestation and struggle. You are now ready to move to subtopic one. Social construction of gender. In order to understand gender identities as socially constructed, we have to begin with distinction between sex and gender. Sex is the biological difference between a man and a woman, or male and female. These categories are not always as discrete as they may seem. Intersexed refers to people who have both male and female genitalia in terms of characteristics. Gender refers to the characteristics of being male and being female. Generally, we think of male as being masculine and female as being feminine. Identity does not equal expression, does not equal sex, does not equal gender, does not equal sexual orientation. This is a teaching tool created by Sam Killerman from thegenderbread.org to show you the differences around gender. The genderbred person has expressions of their identity, their attraction, their sex, and also the expression of who they are. Biological sex refers to your maleness or your femaleness, which is your physical characteristics of what you're born with, including genitalia, body shape, voice, pitch, hair, hormones, chromosomes. Gender identity is how you feel in your head, how you define your gender, based on how much you align or don't align with what you see and you understand your options for gender to be. Your gender expression is the way you want to represent yourself. How do you present yourself to the world through your actions, your dress, your demeanor, and also how you present the interpretation based on gender norms. People express their masculinity and femininity in different ways. But the stories we tell, by the stories we tell in our culture, for example, through the media, 
Often they rely on a stereotypical view that is codified an expression of what gender is meant to be. Attraction. Sexual attraction comes from sexual desire for something or someone, or romantic attraction is the want to have a romantic relationship with somebody outside of sex. Feeling sexually and romantically attracted to someone means different things for different people. Perhaps you feel sexually attracted to multiple or all genders, but only desire to be seriously dating certain genders. Take asexual people who often don't feel a sense of sexual attraction, but enjoy having romantic relationships with one another. Or aromantic er folks who may enjoy having sex, but may not have a desire to be in a romantic relationship. Sexuality. Sexuality refers to the sexual preference and or orientation. Just as we have expectations of appropriate gender roles, we also have expectations of appropriate sexual roles too as well. Men and women are expected to behave certain ways. For example, men are expected to be sexually aggressive while women are meant to be passive. Women are also, who assert themselves, are called negative names that are labeled such as being a slut. The socially acceptable sexual roles not only work to limit and police appropriate behaviors, they also feed into assumptions that women and men must naturally be attracted to the opposite sex. We assume that sexuality is synonymous with heterosexuality. As such, we often assume that heterosexuality is the normal and natural, while homosexuality is framed as deviant and unnatural. People who fail to conform to the acceptable sexual roles are often punished. For instance, people who are gay and or lesbian are often a target of discrimination and hate. Gender performativity. Judith Butler, a well-known theorist of gender performativity, argued that the assumption that gender rightfully belongs to the property of sex, meaning masculine belongs to males and feminine belongs to females, is not true. Men may not necessarily feel or act masculine, and women may not necessarily feel or act feminine. Think of someone who's labeled as a tomboy. Gender is not something that we're uh, born with, it's something that we learn. It's not something that we're born with at all. From the time that we're young boys and girls, we're taught to wear certain things such as pink or blue. We're taught to play with certain uh, toys. We're taught to behave in a certain way. Gender socialization is how young boys and girls learn the culture about their different generalized gender beliefs, values, and practices. The process is how we actively formulate ideas about who we are and how we're supposed to act or not to act. Males and females are socialized very differently in most cultures. As a result of the socialization, stereotypes are often then formed. If we look at gender stereotypes, gender stereotypes refer to the practice of ascribing an individual woman or man specific attributes, characteristics, and roles by reason of their membership in a social group, being a man or being a woman. Gender stereotyping is wrong and can result in a violation or violations of human rights on fundamental basis as against our rights and freedoms. Indeed, both men and women are often represented according to their gender stereotypes in media and advertisements. A gender stereotype is generalized as a specific view or pre preconception about attributes and characteristics and or roles that are um, labeled or ought to be processed by or performed by women and or men. So when we see this image, what thoughts come to mind? The colors, the expressions, right? If we see this other image here whereby typically men and women have kind of been labeled or put into roles that we have seen throughout society. The man usually is the physical hardworking one that would be the work around the home in terms of you know fixing things and drilling whereas the woman would be the one doing the cleaning. But in this particular image we see that it's flipped to the opposite. What story is this image telling you? What thoughts comes to mind? Remember representation is not only about who is being portrayed but also how they're portrayed. How about this image? Right? Woman used to be in the kitchen, now man's in the kitchen, woman's in the boardroom in the office or doing the, the work. This plays into gender roles. Gender roles, unlike sex, are social constructs that are socialized into. From a very young age, boys and girls are taught to be boys and girls are taught to be girls. Whereas girls are encouraged to be cute, sweet, or act a certain way, while boys are taught to be or asked to be aggressive or strong. The important thing to note is that those who fail to comply to their gender are seen by society is often being different and are often bullied, called names, or mistreated. Gender and power. Masculinity is stereotypically associated with the qualities of being strong, rational, independent, intelligent, and aggressive. Femininity is typically associated with the qualities of being nurturing, emotional, weak, kind, maternal. These stereotypes can feed into their gender inequalities. In the workplace, for example, men will often occupy more positions of power than women because they often be, are assumed to be more intelligent, more powerful, and than their female counterparts. Intersectionality. Intersectionality basically is 
how people are looked at. People are often discriminated against based on their status, such as gender, race, sexuality, ethnicity, culture, class, religion, caste, disability, body shape, body size. People are often discriminated because of these various factors, but two or more different statuses can be preyed upon, therefore the person would be at a disadvantage based on more than one area, for example, gender and ability, or gender and race, or gender and sexuality, or any above combination of more than one or two things. Academics and activists have referred to this experience of discrimination from a number of different directions as intersectionality. The term was first coined by Kimberly Crenshaw. Discrimination is like a traffic that goes through an intersection. It may flow in one direction or it may flow in another. If an accident happens at the intersection, it can be caused by cars traveling from a number of different directions, sometimes all those directions, such as the case of intersectionality. Intersectionality. Have you heard this word before? Even if you have, you might not know what it means. Let's take a look at it. The first part's easy enough. Intersection. A place where things come together. Intersectionality refers to the reality that we all have multiple identities that intersect to make us who we are. It also gives us a way to talk about oppressions and privileges that overlap and reinforce each other. This term dates back to the 1980s and legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw. She noticed that we didn't have an effective way to talk about how the experiences of black women are different from the experiences of black men and of white women. How? Black women endure both gender discrimination and racial discrimination. Over the last 30 years, scholars, educators, and activists have expanded the use of the word intersectionality to talk about identities beyond race and gender. Let's look at a few examples. Jerry has a disability, and his family lives below the poverty line. He is the oldest of 10, which requires him to do a lot of caregiving and sometimes keeps him out of school. No one in the school counseling office has talked to Jerry or his parents about his plans for after graduation. He has applied for several jobs, but never gets called back. Fatima is Muslim and recently came to the United States from Somalia. She finds that many people at her school make assumptions about her values and abilities before they speak to her. Many of her classmates think she shouldn't be at their school at all. Greta comes from an affluent family. Both her parents and grandparents went to college and her father owns a successful business. She doesn't think about her identity very often, but she does think of herself as someone who will go to college and get a good job once she graduates. Think about Greta's situation as opposed to Fatima's or Jerry's. Fatima and Jerry are members of marginalized groups. They don't get to choose whether or not to think about their identities. Greta, on the other hand, can ignore intersectionality if she wants to. Life isn't the same for everyone, even for people who share identity characteristics. By adopting an intersectional lens, we have a better opportunity to understand why and to change the institutions that help and harm us based on who we are. Want to learn more? Read our story, Teaching at the Intersections, in the summer 2016 issue of Teaching Tolerance magazine. While we exert some control over the construction of our identities, our presentation and our behavior expectations are attached to different statuses that often lead to stereotyping, prejudice, and discrimination. Stereotypes. Stereotypes are unwanted, unwarranted generalizations about a particular group that can be based on race, ethnicity, gender, religion, or other status. Unjustified expectations that rely on the received wisdom or casual observation rather than on the actual evidence presented. Stereotypes are often persistent because they are subject to confirmation bias. Once a stereotype exists, people selectively notice situations that seem to confirm or reinforce the expectation of the stereotype, thus perpetuating the stereotype further. Stereotype threat is one of the dangers as well as stereotyping that people who are being stereotyped start to believe the false characterizations. Stereotyping threats 
basically our poor performance in the face of negative stereotypes. Asians are good at math. Women can't do math. One would be thought to be positive, another would be thought to be negative. However, the two groups, Asian females who are college students, were given a math test before the test. One group was given the survey and they were told and highlighted positively their Asian identity and background about being good in math. The other group was given the survey and highlighted the fact that they were female and that women can't do math so well. The group who were made sensitive to their Asian heritage performed much better on the test than the group who were made sensitive about their heritage, uh, sorry, about their gender. Prejudice and discrimination. Stereotypes are often thought of or seem harmless, but we, may, we must be aware of their existence, particularly when linked to prejudice and also discrimination. While stereotypes are unfounded because they cannot apply to all or even most members of a particular group, they're not always negative. Stereotypes can be positive, negative, or even neutral. Prejudice, on the other hand, refers to the negative, often unconscious, preconceived notion that people have about others. The word prejudice can be broken down into two parts, pre and judgment. For example, all Muslim women are oppressed. That's judging a whole group, class, culture of people based on a stereotype. Prejudice differs from stereotypes insofar as that they contain a moral judgment about individuals or groups. To the extent that we judge others negatively without even knowing who they are, we are displaying prejudice attitudes. Discrimination. Discrimination is when people act on those stereotypes and prejudice notions that they engage in this act of discrimination. Discrimination is any act, whether deliberate or not, that has the intent or the effect of adversely affecting others on the grounds of their merit or acquired skills. For example, re refusing to hire somebody because of their skin color. This was all part of our culture for a very long time. Social construction of race has perpetuated discrimination and stereotyping. What is race? Race is a popular assumption that somehow, genetically or physically, the differences that we have are based on our skin color. They are biological differences between individuals and also between different people who are grouped based on the geological, geographical region. However, these biological differences between two individuals are far greater than the differences between the presumed races of people. Political and social factors, more than science and biology, provide us with these categories of race that we're, we are familiar with today. Understand that race was a social construct created by Eurocentric people in the 1700s in order to enable power to those of the elite ruling class and take away opportunities and take away privilege from those who did not have the privilege. It was done on purpose through legislation and through constructs of part of the society. Historically, race was a concept used to dominate certain groups and take away their land. When we think of race, and often we think of non-white people, at various times all throughout history, groups like the Irish or Italians or Jews were all described as inferior races at one point in time or another. Now they've all ascribed to be part of the white race. Notions of differences combined with theories of superiority and inferiority justifies colonial expansion and exploitation. The concept of race was used to control, marginalize, oppress very large segments of the population and other people. Race is not a scientific category. 
race is not a very good or useful scientific category. Biologically, it is not very meaningful. However, the categories of race that exist in our society are very important and very meaningful social categories. They impact nearly every aspect of our lived experiences. And we still, as a culture, have very strong beliefs, expectations, and stereotypes that impact people based on their race. So even though sociologists can say that race isn't real, it doesn't mean that its impacts are not real. Race might not be biologically real, but socially, it's very real. This screen has four images of racially ambiguous people. They all have light brown skin shades. They all look happy, but you can only see their faces and not much of their clothing or their surroundings. There's a young woman with brown curly hair, an old man with short hair and a beard, a girl around age four or five with long dark hair, and a young man with short hair. The point is that we might racialize any of these people differently depending on where they are. For example, imagine these people in a cafe in Toronto. In the diverse context of Toronto, any of these people might be Canadian-born and English-speaking. Now, what if we imagine them to be in, say, Paris, France? We might assume something else about them. Would you think that they were tourists, immigrants, or would they be assumed to be French-speaking and French-born people? Why or why not? What kinds of racial or ethnic identities would you expect them to have? What if you imagine these people in a market in New Delhi, India? Who looks like they belong? Would they be racialized as South Asian? What would you assume about their identities? Why or why not? Words matter, and it's really important to describe social concepts and ideas accurately. This is why the terms we use to talk about race seem to change often. So instead of saying, what race are you? We can ask the question, how are you racialized? And know that we can all be racialized differently in different cities, countries, or other contexts. How would you racialize the people you see here, and why? Your culture, how you do things, influences your identity, specifically your ethnic identity, which we can also call your ethnicity. Your ethnicity is about belonging to a social category or group, or to more than one. You might identify with a particular country, or with a regional group, subgroup, or other group in that country, Maybe you're part of a religion or a specific subgroup within a religion, or you might identify with a language group. All of these might shape your ethnic identity. In other words, culture is about what you do and how you do it, and ethnicity is about who is part of the same group as you and does things in the same way. Ethnocentrism. Ethnic identity and cultural practices are external and acquired or learned. As many first-generation and immigrant Canadians know, while your perceived race may not change, your cultural identity may change when you move to a different society. The Genet 500 textbook defines ethnocentrism as, quote, the tendency to believe one's own culture is superior and evaluate all others in comparison. Unquote. So, ethnocentrism is when we think that our culture is the best or has the best way of doing things. Here is an example of how ethnocentrism works. What kinds of foods do you find gross? What, to you, is the best food in the world? Can you think of something that other people, perhaps from another culture, eat that you could never eat? What do you think about eating insects? If you think that your food preferences make sense while other people's food choices are weird or gross, you might be being ethnocentric. Ethnocentrism is when we think our way of doing things, or our culture's way of doing things, is the best way, and that others are less good or strange or make less sense than our way of doing things. Race and resistance. You must note that activists, artists, intellectuals, and everyday people have always challenged racism. Racial identities that we originally imposed to legitimize oppression and to mark inferiority have been reclaimed 
as sources of pride and political struggle, as well as part of community, by rejecting the negative roles ascribed to race and finding inspiration in the histories of, and of social and political struggle of resistance, many have embraced racial and ethnic categories as identities useful for social justice struggles. If we look at the social identity wheel, and we do this as an activity, you can download it online within the, the, um, the last section there, towards the bottom for uh, an activity. You fill out the outer rim of the identity wheel and write down your answers to the four questions in the center of the wheel. You start to look at, from a self-reflective perspective, which identity do I most often think about? Which identity do I often think least about? Which identity would I like to learn more about? And which identity has the strongest effect on how I see myself as a person? So looking at these different things in terms of your first language, your na native language, your national origin, your age, sex, gender, orientation, socioeconomic class, ethnicity, race, religion, spiritual affiliation, physical development, emotional development, right? Your ability, all these factors make up part of your identity and also make up part of who you are. So we have seen in this section that our identities are shaped by social, political, and cultural factors. But we also have a certain amount of control over our identities, right? What we post on social media, what we reflect upon, what we show us who we are, what we want people to see, and how we present ourselves to the world. One way we might define ourselves is as a global citizen. We might think of ourselves as citizens of the world whose assumptions, attitudes, and actions will affect the lives of people all over the world. Thank you for paying attention and listening to this week's lecture on Identity Part 2.